Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. On today's episode of Black Thought, we are talking about when they see us and not only the ramifications of what happened in the past, but we're also looking at the present and the future. Tune in right here on the M1 Network. Greetings, 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 and welcome to Watching Black Thought on the M1 Network, and I'm your host, Dr. Hutchinson. Glad to be before you in this way. Thank you for your viewership and support of the M1 Network, emanating from the great studios of the basement in Memphis, Tennessee. Glad to be here. First of all, if you want to figure out who I am, who is this man spouting off all of this wisdom or lack thereof in front of us? Well, you can go to my website, noelhutchinson.com. You know how to spell it, N-O-E-L-H-U-T-C-H-I-N-S-O-N.com. When you go there, you'll find out ample information about me, and it will give you a better idea of who is sitting behind this desk. All right, let me get to the crux of the matter today. On the 31st of May, just a few days ago, Netflix released a documentary series entitled When They See Us. It was produced by Anna DuVernay, excellent um, filmmaker, and the subject matter was the Central Park Five. These were the young men that were sent to jail for the alleged rape of a jogger in Central Park New York back in 1989. They were sent to jail in spite of cooked up confessions that they were forced to make. Sent to jail in spite of the fact that their parents were not really allowed to see them and they did not have legal representation. Sent to jail even though the fabricated quote unquote facts that they were forced to share under testimony, under oath, in um, confessional type situations did not match the realities of the crime scene where the woman was raped. And so they had to finagle these situations, these, these five testimonies together so that they could figure out how to paint this picture to get these boys convicted. And what was interesting about this is the five young men, except for two of them, didn't even know each other before uh, they found themselves locked up. But now let me give you the rest of the story. They were not guilty. They maintained their innocence even after they were convicted. And in, I think it was 2003, a gentleman came forward. He was already in jail. Matter of fact, he had crossed paths with Corey Wise, one of the five in jail. And he confessed to the crime. Everything he said checked out. And his DNA matched the DNA at the crime scene. None of the other five boys' DNA match. This gentleman's DA, DNA match. You know, your DNA, I, and I don't think I have to get into that too much, is basically your physical signature. It, it determines you from other people. It's almost like a, uh, a fingerprint, but even more accurate. And so here it is. They became exonerated by the state of New York. Their slate was wiped clean. The two of them that were in jail at the time were set free. Their records were totally clear. 
and they received a settlement of $41 million from the state of New York. Now, how much of that $41 million they actually saw, we don't know, because you have to understand, there were probably lawyers' fees on the back end of the whole nine, and also other stuff. So I doubt that they saw the total of $41 million, but they got a significant piece. But that money will never replace the pain and suffering they went through. So I applaud, first of all, the efforts of Anna DuVernay in putting this together. And the way she did it, she showed us the humanity of the boys. Over four episodes, we begin to get glimpses into their home life. We got a full glimpse of what happened on the night in question. And she took us through the trial. She took us through them being in jail. And now many people get upset and can't even make it through the first episode. As much as it bothered me, the fourth episode for me was the roughest. That's when we saw Corey Wise in jail and what he went through in jail. And let me share this with you so you can better understand what you may see. I know some of you may not have seen it yet, but I'm really not giving that much away. I could probably tell you the whole plot and still not give it away. It was that awesome. In the jail culture, when you are convicted of rape, they look at you as short eyes. And because of that, Excuse me. That inmate guilty of rape gets abused in prison. Gets beat up, may get raped themselves, and all other signs of disrespect. Because I understand for many, to rape a woman is the greatest sign of disrespect. Not only to that woman, but to all women. And so this is what we have in this show. Now, I want to say a couple of things about it. And I want to point to the past, talk about the present, then point to the future. And then I'll be out your way. The past. We have a tendency to feel that, number one, those of you who live in the South and have lived in the South for some time, like me, feel like we don't go through changes in the North. They feel like racism doesn't really exist in the North. Well, I hope that when you see this, you'll be clear that racism indeed exists in the North. It may look a little different, but it is indeed there. Because first of all, when you watch this, you will see how the DA and others pulled together this false information to convict these boys. And I share with this with you because that's not much different than what has happened to others in a similar position. But their cases didn't have the same sort of notoriety as this case. So you have to be clear, this happened all the time. The mere fact that they felt they could do this is indication that they had probably done this before in several instances. Now, many of you know I'm a native New Yorker and I was in New York when this took place back in 1989. And I remember the furor in the black communities as to how these young men were getting railroaded. I remember what the talk radio persons were saying. I remember what was being said on the street. I'm talking about the black side of things. And I remember how we saw that the evidence didn't match up. And I remember seeing them getting railroaded into jail. And when I saw this series, it brought all of that back. And I had to say, there but for the grace of God go I. I mean, it, it would be very easy if you were in the wrong place at the wrong time, maybe just doing what young people do and get arrested, that the same thing could have happened to me. 
Because now let's roll this back so you can kind of fully understand. In the beginning, we find out that yes, a bunch of teenagers were in Central Park. It was right near where they lived. And so they went in the park to let off a little steam. A very small number of these young people started harassing people in the park, scaring them, uh, pushing them off bikes, that sort of thing. And in a separate incident, this young man, I think his last name was Reyes, raped this Central Park job. It was a separate incident, didn't have anything to do with the young people, either the young people that were just there, innocent, or the other. I think of times when, for example, I got on the subway with some friends of mine and we had the music blaring and we had a party right there in the subway train. Now, what if we had gotten caught and what if something was blamed on us that we didn't do? I might not be sitting there today and then in various other places, just hanging out. And I remember how the police would come by and just rustle people, ask and ask them for ID, put them in the squad car. So it's not outside the realm of possibility that this has happened before. And I was sharing with my wife an incident that happened to a friend of mine. Now, time has dimmed my exact recollection in this regard. I don't remember if my friend was busted like this or somebody he knew was busted. But the story behind it is the same. They hopped the turnstiles in the subway. They got busted and was put in a room with other persons that hopped the turnstile. Transit police talked to them real ugly. Now mind you, they hadn't gone before a judge they hadn't been booked. They were just put in a room. Parents weren't contacted. They were put in a room. While in the room, these cops pulled two of the young people in particular out in front of this crowded room of young people, beat the mess out of them, and then told the others if we catch you again, this is what we're going to do to you. Now get the F out of here. And they let them go. That was commonplace in the 70s and the 80s in New York. And I want you to go back in your mind, all of the things that you heard, Howard Beach, Bensonhurst, different things, Sean Bell. Eric Gardner, all that happened in New York. So as much as New York is this great place, land opportunity, biggest city in the country, skyscrapers, all of the superlatives you hear about New York. On the other side, New York's one of the most racist cities in America. Now it's gotten a little better, but not much better. Be clear on what I'm telling you. Also, let's take this a step further. Before I do that, I just remembered something else. Khalif Browder, in custody for two years, I think it was about two years, no trial, not booked, just held in Rikers Island. Now, y'all, out of all the jails, well, first of all, you don't want to go to jail, period, but if you go, you don't want to go to Rikers Island. Trust me when I tell you. I've been out there as a visitor. And I know what it felt like. So can you imagine what it's like as an inmate? And I went to a minimum security side of it. You don't want to go out there. So now let me take it to the next step. And this kind of takes us to the present. Things like, like what you see and when they see us, how young people are railroaded, how we see these types of um, unfair treatment. 
They happen every day all around this country. Every day. And it happens often. Think about it. Sandra Bland was stopped. This was a traffic stop. And just a day or so later, she's in a jail cell and she loses her life. And they want to tell you that it was a suicide. And we have instances of that all over the country. So I've seen where people have said, well, we need to go after some of these historical um, judgments to try and get justice. Somebody said, we ought to go after the person that lied on Emmett Till. We ought to go after this or after that. Y'all, let me tell you as the Bible says, a more excellent way. Because you going after the person that lied on Emmett Till or lied on others like that is not going to fix the equation. What needs to happen is reform. Right here in Memphis, the Department of Justice came in, looked at what was happening in juvenile court, said this is not right said it needed oversight. Now, of course, there are those here who said the, it was good for the oversight to be taken away after a while because we kind of got this under control. No, we don't have it under control. And let me make this real simple so you can understand so that you don't think I'm just having conversation. If you are picked up by the police and you come from South Memphis and you're a juvenile, your treatment has been far different than somebody picked up by the police in Germantown. Now, both of you are supposed to make it down the 201 pop. But most of the time, the one in South Memphis goes, but the one in Germantown may or may not go. They may stay in Germantown and be released into the custody of their parents, while the one downtown slash South Memphis is going to the jail and is not released. That those were some of the findings in the DOJ report. This is happening all over this country. So you have many Central Park Five situations happening today all over this country. So here's the question, y'all. What are we going to do about it? Good question, isn't it? Well, first of all, some of this, number one, deals with legislation. How do you shape laws to ensure that we have equity across the board? And so you have advocacy groups such as Just City and the M1 Project here in Memphis. And I want to give a quick shout out to Josh uh, Spickler and Demetria Frank for their work in these regards. And they're fighting the fight to make sure that some of this disparity is corrected. So you have that. Then number two, there needs to be advocacy concerning our DA's office. And we need to pay attention to what DAs do across this country. Not only here in Memphis, and that's a whole nother conversation, but across this country. Because if you watch 
then they when they see us, you will see how the DA and the judges got involved with well, DA, I'll say, not the judges, got involved in shaping this thing so these young men could go to jail. Then this DA um, in New York profited off of it because she wrote three or four books after the fact. So we have to look at that and pay attention to what's going on around you. So we have to get involved in this. Because while we sit and cry, and while some say they can't watch it because it's too painful, and I understand about triggers and how these things can trigger you, but guess what? A lot of y'all don't have triggers. You just don't want to think about what's truthfully happening in our neighborhoods each and every day. And then you want to jump on the bandwagon of triggers. And let me remind you of something else. Donald Trump weighs in this because Donald Trump took out a full page ad saying that these boys should get the death penalty. Now, what happened if they had gotten the death penalty and then we found out on the back end that they were innocent, like we did? And he has never apologized or spoken to these young men about what he said about their lives. And some of y'all that have watched this voted for him for president. After some of us, yours truly included, told you what this man did regarding this. And you still talk about he'll make America great again. And some of y'all under religious guise that said he's the greatest Christian, et cetera, et cetera. And he's going to bring us back to family values. Really? Y'all voted for him. I'm going to tell you straight, y'all be ashamed of yourself. So we have a chance to get involved in these areas, to bring change to our communities on behalf of our young folk so this stops happening. Well, y'all, I put that on your mind. It's time for me to go. And as I go, brother man, sister woman, young boy, young girl, put your mind in gear. Put your thinking cap on. Peace. Hi, I'm Deidre Malone, the host of Dialogue with Deidre. You can find us on the M1 TV network on YouTube. Subscribe and follow us. You can also find us on Facebook at M1 TV Network Twitter, M1 TV Network 2, and Instagram, M1 TV Network 2. Please follow us so you can keep up to date with what's going on on the M1 TV network with Dialogue with Deidre and Black Thought.